I want to first thank the organizers of the 2021 Software Education Forum for the invitation to speak at this event. It's truly a great honor to be able to share with you my work and software education philosophy. I am Professor Chris Ferry. I've been a researcher and lecturer at the University of Technology, Sydney for about five years, where my team investigates and writes quantum software. These are programs designed to run on future quantum computers and firmware that helps improve the performance of today's quantum computers. Some of the programs are for training quantum neural networks. Now this all sounds like pretty cutting edge technology. Why am I throwing all of these jargon words at you? And the reason is because I decided to teach it to babies. <laughs> okay, so that's a bit of a tongue in cheek joke, but this is a real book. I wrote it with my colleague and friend, Dr. Sarah Kaiser. As you can see, it's called Neural Networks for Babies. The short book, as are most baby books. So I think I actually have time to read it to you. So let's get started. Now, all my books start the same way. They start, this is a ball. This is a neuron. It sends messages throughout your body. Give the neuron input and output, and it can help us learn. Give the ball an output, an input, and it acts like a neuron. The neuron can have one input, an output, or many. Is there a red animal in this picture? The neuron can help us decide based on its input. When the neuron has an answer, it sends its own message. Does this animal have eight arms? The neuron can decide based on its input. When the neuron has an answer, it sends its own message. Where do the messages go? Neurons talk to each other. They connect together in a network. Input neurons look at parts of the picture. Output neurons have answers about the picture. Neurons in between don't see the pictures or give answers. They are hidden. How do the hidden neurons learn to decide? Training data can have correct labels on them. After training, the network has learned to label new pictures. A really big network can solve even harder problems with the help of computers. Now you know neural networks. <laughs> Congratulations. I'll say that that book is not the first book or the last that I've written. In fact, I've written nearly 100 books for kids about science and technology. Now, 100 books sounds like a lot. Uh, I must really want babies to know science and technology, right? Sure, but the point is not that these should be like preschool textbooks or something. Please don't create quizzes and exams for babies using my books as source material. This is probably a recipe for achieving the exact opposite of what I and you want to get out of these books. I'll also note uh, for posterity, the first book wasn't Neural Networks for Babies. It all started with Quantum Physics for Babies, and it had some early fans. <laughs> okay, so let me say at this point that the you I'm talking to is not the baby. Even though I just read a baby book, I'm talking to you, the parent or teacher. Since you'll be the one buying the book, I ought to tell you what I think that you should get out of it. Yes, of course, there are facts and easy to understand explanations of science and technology in the books, 
but also it's fun. And this is mostly the point. Let me share with you a few observations that I've seen when looking at parents and hearing from parents and children when interacting with my books. So the first is that parents think it's odd to have a book about neural networks or quantum physics for children. But at the same time, children choose to read my books every night. So this seems like a contradiction. But I want to tell you that there is no contradiction here. The answer is simple. Most people are wrong about what should and shouldn't be in children's books. You see, children don't know what quantum physics is. They don't know what neural networks are. So to them, this is just another book, a book with new pictures and words that will be read to them by an enthusiastic adult. What more could you ask for as a child? These books offer a door to a new world of science and technology most do not get to explore or appreciate. You can open that door for your children by being open and enthusiastic about reading, seeing, exploring, and building technology. Now, you might think, hmm, well, I don't know much about history or geography, but if that's important, they'll teach my child what they need to know about it in school, right? So if there's something important, surely they're going to learn it in school. So you get to dust your hands and pat yourself on the back and tell yourself, like, that's one problem that's sorted. The school has it handled. And maybe that's true for things that don't change much over time, like history. But consider this. What is currently in the curriculum about technology and software in the state my children go to school in was written before the first iPhone was invented. 2003. <laughs> uh, is when the syllabus for software and information technology was written. What happens is that schools deal with technology in ad hoc ways because the curriculum can't keep up. Take, for example, TikTok. So TikTok was obviously invented after 2003, and many school administrators are only just hearing about it now. And the problem is that they don't hear about TikTok as new technology that needs to be understood and integrated into education, and it's treated as a nuisance that needs to be managed. Just ban it. Abstinence only technology education is what happens in many schools. And of course, it's not standardized. The beauty of a curriculum is that you have a standardized education system, but there's so much technology that has been invented since 2003 that Every one school and state and country deal with it in their own unique ways. And usually it's in the context of finding ways not to talk about it. So here's my daughter. This is when she was age nine. And what she's doing here is programming a cloud-based quantum computer. Okay? In particular, there's a quantum computer or at the time, <laughs> there was a quantum computer housed in IBM's lab, pulled down to one of the coldest places in the entire universe, and she's sending individual instructions, writing code, writing software, to run on this quantum computer. Now that sounds pretty incredible for a nine-year-old. I offered to go into schools and teach other kids and show them that they can do this too. They can program and access quantum computers. But the schools weren't interested. And why is that? The reason, again, is simple. It's not in the curriculum. And it sounds too difficult. What happens after I leave and children have questions? Is there someone at the school that can help manage these questions? The teachers don't have the training and find it too difficult to learn these new things when they have to hit every other curriculum dot point. So this attitude that some things are just too difficult, whether they are indeed difficult or whether you've convinced yourself it is difficult because you just don't want to do it, that attitude gets adopted by the children and then they believe it's, and then they have unhealthy attitudes towards technology. If you want your children to have 
positive attitudes towards technology, it has to start and be cultivated at home. You can't trust that children are getting this elsewhere. Technology moves too fast now to be included in curriculum. Even 100 books are not enough. But I think they're a start for helping parents and teachers lower that entry barrier to software and artificial intelligence education. And of course, there's a lot more to do, and what needs to be done will continue to evolve along the rapid pace of technology development and change. We don't have all the answers figured out, but I think we have a good place to start. So much of our lives are now dominated by software. Some software we use as tools to help us get things done. So think about, for example, digital spreadsheets, which have been around since before I was even born. Now I've used several pieces of software to create and record this presentation. And my ability to use this software allows me to do all sorts of things that the average person can't. I taught myself these things because I had problems that I needed to solve. And I used technology and software that helped me achieve these things. But today, there's some software that is used for several hours a day. And people that use that do not know why it does what it does or what the purpose it's meant to serve. I'm sure many of you have had the urge or are having the urge right now to pick up your smartphone. And what is the smartphone going to do? It's actually going to tell you what you want to consume or solve. And that's the major shift that we're seeing and why software education is so important. Because technology has invaded our lives to the point where we don't even use it as a tool. We don't know why we're using it or what it's doing. But when we have a piece of software like social media, which contain ads, we think that this is a tool and everyone can use that tool and everybody who uses that tool will use it in the same way. But just open a social media application on two different phones and you'll see that it's completely different and tailored to the person who is using the device. My advertisements are for tech products. My wife's advertisements are for exercise clothes. Most people think that when they consume social media, they're using a tool that is informing them about what they want to know. When in fact, it's quite the opposite. Those people who are using it are the product and are just there to filter <laughs> attention and money through the corporations that are building this up. You need to know what the purpose is, even if you don't have a deep understanding of the software and the technology behind it. So the understanding needs to happen, especially for children, so that they realize the purpose and utility of software. But also, if you don't like it, you too can build your own tools to achieve your goals. What's more, you, now I'm talking about you, <laughs> you as in the children, not the ones that are watching, but this is what you're going to be teaching them. You can build entire worlds. We used to romanticize explorers and they went out on ships and discovered new lands. And now there's actually nothing new left to discover. We've mapped out the entire, the entire world. But the point of exploration was only ever to push the frontier of collective human knowledge. And we still do that, but it's done at the level of ideas. There is, in fact, an infinite world out there to explore. And science, math, technology, these are all tools you need to embark on that journey. I want to end with at least one concrete call to action here. So I've received many messages about my books from parents. These always have cute photos of children with my books. I showed you some earlier. But I also receive messages from teachers. And these teachers are often not teachers of 
primary school children, but of teenagers. Now, why would teenagers want to read baby books? That's an easy one to answer. They're actually not being read. They're being used as examples of how to communicate ideas. So Einstein famously said, if you can't explain it to a five-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. Now, indeed, even in the medical community, they have a motto for surgeons, and it goes like this. Learn one, do one, teach one. So that is, you can't be a surgeon unless you've taught surgery to someone else. So these teachers have tasked their students with writing children's books about the topics they're learning in their physics class, their geology class, their history class, and so on. So if you're a teacher or a parent out there uh, listening, why don't you try this with your children or students? So rather than force learning upon them, tax them with teaching it to someone else. So if you have an older child, you can get them to, as a project, write a baby book about software education or some aspect of software, neural networks or whatever you may, whatever they may be learning, whatever their learning outcomes currently are. Flip that around and have them teach it to someone else. And with that, I think I'll end. Uh, I think I've covered uh, quite a bit and hopefully you've in, enjoyed the book uh, and the talk. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me here online or on, on Twitter. All right, thank you very much.